Welcome back, everyone. We're here live with a special, well, not for me, not for you guys if you're in the, uh, the UK, but for an early morning episode of the Square Table Degenerates podcast. Sunny morning. It's, well, I'm not going to lie and say it's beautiful outside. It's cold as hell in Cleveland. But we're joined today by Mr. Chris. Um, is it, um, I forget how to pronounce your last name. Is it Amu? Uh, Amu? You got it, man. Just nice, say nice. how it's spelled. Just say how it's spelled. Nice, nice. From the band, the sim, the the real thing, uh, and he's a yeah. famous dog breeder too. How are you today, sir? How's uh, how you, how's how's life treating you? Life's great at the moment. Um, we're just about coming out of the worst part of COVID at the moment, and um, hopefully things are starting to get back to normal a little bit now. And um, yeah, we're just about kicking off, getting ready to go. You know. Nice, nice. Now you uh, obviously you're from England. Now, well, uh, you did, were you born in Liverpool? Did you grow up there? How did you come? Were you uh, how did you come to be in that area? Like, were you did your parents come from? I don't know. You know, what I mean, give me your uh, like back that kind of background. Yeah, um, yeah. I was born in a place called Toxteth in Liverpool, which is the inner city of Liverpool. And uh, my uh, father I was from Ghana. And my mother was um, English, uh, well, half Irish and Nigerian. So my okay. grandmother was Irish. And um, yes, um, she was born in, in Liverpool as well, my mother. Okay. So, um, and most of the people I know, most of my friends that I grew up with in the inner city area of Liverpool, which is uh, the ghetto of Liverpool, um, had white Irish parents, okay. You know, okay. Um, married to African or West Indian, so it's a very mixed. Um, it's a very mixed area where we come from, and it was a real community area that I grew up in in Liverpool, which was absolutely fantastic. And um, I still live not really that far away from there now. A lot of my family still live there, and it's easy for me to cute, uh, compute, commute in whenever I want. It takes forty-five minutes, and I'm in the ghetto. Man. Okay, okay. We got a question from Captain. He says, "Ask him about Liverpool signing Diaz." I think that if they do, we'll win the league off those idiots up the road in Manchester. Oh, so he's throwing down the hammer on Manchester. Now you have to educate me now. How many? So is um, how did Liverpool do in the? Now is the Premier League season going on right now, or no? Or is it over? You see, what you're making me do at the moment is feel rather ill and not too good at all. When really you should be bringing me up for a nice interview. <laughs> They're second at the moment to that lot that live. 20 miles away from me down the road, Manchester. I like the Manchester people who come to see us when we're singing, but I don't like the teams. Oh, uh, it's like that with uh, with American football over here. We got, I'm obviously a big, oh, I'm, uh, you don't know, but I'm a, I'm a huge Browns fan. You know, I uh, got season tickets and like, you know, people from Pittsburgh, for example, is a major city right down the road. It's, I mean, it's a little bit farther. It's not, not like 20 minutes away, but it's about you know, two hours away. But nice football. people, you know, without football, it's whatever, but as soon as Sunday hits, man, it's a, uh, it's button heads. Oh yeah, we're but nice friendly. Sometimes I'm not gonna lie though, and for, for football, I mean, we, we the Browns were so bad. Like the Browns were next level sucky. That for a while it kind of sucked because we couldn't really say anything to tease them because they just beat us for like 20 games in a row or something one time. It was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It was ridiculous. yeah. Well, you know that's that's the way it is. That's the way it is. We've got two teams in Liverpool, and sometimes in the same family you've got supporters of both teams. So when they go to the match, you've got half your family up there supporting that lot. And you've got another half of your family supporting our lot down this way. So that's how it is in England, man. But that's how it is. No, oh, that's great, man. So, so when you were coming up in Liverpool, did I got to ask you about the, the elephant in the room in Liverpool. I mean, this is uh, just me, but the Beatles, man, they were obviously big, huge, probably the biggest band in history, if we're being real. Now, you were about that age when they came out. I would assume you're probably in grade school or something like that. What uh, did they, was, were they big in your community? Did they influenced you a lot, or were they kind of just like, okay, I'm sick of the Beatles? How was that coming up? Um, 
they didn't influence me because I was from a younger generation uh, than the Beatles. So um, by the time I actually started listening to music, um, the Beatles weren't as prominent in our lives. It, they, they didn't really come into Toxteth, right? Because right. in Toxteth, like I say, in Toxteth, it was more um, the sort of the Black American soul music, that and and the and the the high life African uh, music and the reggae and that that was going on in Toxteth, and they were the sort of bands that influenced me um, and my group growing up. But my brother Eddie, who passed away a couple of years ago. He was a lot older than me, and he was in a group before me called The Chants. And they had a lot to do with the Beatles, a lot to do with them. And um, so there was a real strong connection there. And I have to tell you that our manager, um, a guy called Tony Hall, he was very instrumental over his very, he was very respected to introducing a lot of the black music over here, people like Otis Redden, all them bands, Righteous Brothers, uh, you know, even, you know, that You've Lost That Love and Feeling and things like that. He was the one who introduced all that type of music over here. He was very instrumental in that. He was also one of the first um, white uh, English people to ever produce an album for Blue Note Records in America. So he was very, very influential. Now, he was very close to the Beatles. He was very close to the Beatles. And when um, we went to America and we played in a place called the Roxy in Los Angeles. Okay. And our manager was sat in the audience at the back with Ringo Starr from the Beatles. And Ringo happened to say to him, hey, Tony, is, are they related to the chants in any way? And Tony says, well, yeah, their older brother was part of the chance. So it's a small world. Also, we won the best new band of 1976. So we had to do what it was called then was the Daily Mirror Pop Awards. It was like the precursor to today's Brit Awards, right? Yeah. And we won best new band of 76. And the Beatles won, uh, not the Beatles, Wings won best band that year. Oh, so man. once again, we met up with Paul McCartney and we were just stood backstage ready to go on. And he said, Eddie, Eddie, do you, you know, and he started talking to her because he remembered Eddie, obviously, from the chance, you know. And he says, I made up that you've made it finally, you know. And um, Eddie just said to him, well, Paul, yeah, it's great. But now we've just got to keep it going. And Paul says, oh, it's easy, Ed. It's easy. Just keep doing what you're doing. He was so down to earth and so cool and it was really nice and we've got a really nice picture together of us with him you know and um so although like i say we didn't have much to do with the beatles it was there in the background but we weren't as the real thing we're never influenced by the beatles okay now what, coming up by when you were uh, your first early musical influence now you touched on some of the you know 70s uh american soul mm -hmm. bands like you know, Reading and all that did you were, were you guys is where did you first get into music like a couple years prior to 76 and then were you like were the americans uh you know hendrix yeah. and i guess you know redding and al green and all that great music by the way motown was that your major influences you know over there coming you know singing songs or what was what did you have any influences or just kind of just a combination of all of it all my influences were those guys. Not so much Otis Redden. Once again, Otis Redden was just, how can I put it? If I said to you, he was just slightly before us. We were aware of him. We were aware of him. And I used to like stuff by him. But we were the Temptations, man. Oh, Temptations. Temptations. Great. Cloud Nine, Can't Get Next to You. That's when we, you know, um, OJs. You know, um, and them type of bands. You see, the thing about growing up in Toxteth was there was an American base, which was only about half an hour outside of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. But all the black Americans used to come into Toxteth of a weekend because there was a lot of clubs in Toxteth, 
right? And th this, the, this is the only place where you could hear that music. It wasn't on mainstream radio. Oh yeah, Red, uh, any any kind of music like that, uh, the soul even it, going in R&B. They it, never played it, it until was, like mid '80s, really. Hard. Well, no, it, it was in the '70s as well, but early '70s, very early '70s. I'm talking like '70. Okay. So about 1970, 71. It was only just breaking through. I'd never seen him. I'd never seen him. The Temptations and things. I'd never seen him. Right? I'd never seen anyone who really looked like me on television doing all that, you know. And then all of a sudden, man, the Temptations were on. And you looked at them and you thought, they look like me. Hey, what's that? They're doing. So basically, the, 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 the American servicemen were bringing the music with them from the base because they had all the imports straight away. You could buy all the imports on the American bases. They brought all them into Toxic. We were allowed in because, and like I say, even though we were too young, the owners knew my mother. The owners knew my father. They knew my, you know, they knew us. As long as you behave yourselves, lads, and you, you can't have anything to drink, we don't mind you coming in, but behave yourselves. So we were listening to all the, these, this music, and that's what we were going <coughs> on, you know. So we used to go back and we'd look at these guys like Temptations on television, you know. We go back home, me and Dave, who formed the real thing, and we started singing in our front room over the records. And then, because we knew that that's what we wanted to do, because my brother was doing it, and we knew that we could, um, we could be, we could have a living from it. We weren't thinking records or hits. We were just thinking that we can, instead of being a bricklayer, we can sing on stage. Because my brother was doing, he was professional, professionally doing it on stage. And so we started singing together in our front room. Then gradually we started to learn how to do harmonies and things like that. And then we started to take it a little bit more seriously. We started going on stage ourselves in the local youth clubs and the clubs in Toxteth and things like that, you know, and really um, getting a, a sort of a thirst for it. And um, so that's what we were influenced by then. Four Tops, Temptations, all them type of bands coming in. Anyone who was doing music that we ourselves could sing to and sing along to. And of course, we had to be able to do the latest dances to, of course. Yeah. So long as they had that goal for them, the youth in Toxteth, that's what we were all listening to. We were not listening to the Beatles or anybody else. That's what we were listening to. I would imagine that by that point, I mean, I, I just studying history in America, I mean, the Beatles invasion, I would imagine by that point, 70, 71, everybody was probably, well, the Beatles probably split up in 70, but... I would imagine by that point, everybody in at least, in, and this is me speculating, but you guys had to be pretty sick of the Beatles by then, at least like, internally. I mean, you probably, probably like some of the songs where you're like, okay, if I got to hear Hold My Hand one more time, I'm going to you know, jump off into the Thames River or something like that. Would that be uh, would that be something fair to say? Like, would, well, let me ask you about any, like, when, 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 you were, when you were coming up, was there was there any bands you were like, like they just played out on the radio, you just got so sick of, you couldn't stand to listen to anymore? No. It, because in all honesty, by the point where I was really aware of the Beatles, the Beatles were on another planet. Okay. But they were also producing the best stuff. Do you understand what I'm saying? So okay. it's like I could listen to them as I was getting older. I could listen to, to them more and appreciate more what they were doing. When they were doing Strawberry Fields and all that, I could appreciate them more. And I knew how good they were. But they weren't influencing me in any way. But I knew how good they were. You know, I, I could appreciate that these guys were good, you know, but they just weren't influential with me. And no, I didn't get to the stage where you were sick of it because, like I say, we were mainly listening to stuff that we weren't listening to on the radio. So it wasn't really worth turning the radio. In fact, I didn't even have a television until so I got to a certain age anyway to even see them. Um, and as far as radio goes, we weren't really listening to radio, man. We were listening 
to the records that we'd bring home and put on our record player. We weren't really listening because we didn't hear what we wanted to hear on the radio. We didn't hear it, you know. It was like only now and again, if if one of them scraped into the charts, like the temps, you know, and things like that, Stevie, and things like that might get into the charts and things, and you'd hear them. But you'd be hearing all them anyway. Oh yeah. Room. So no, I didn't tune in to radio and things like that. It wasn't our thing. Then. Now, was what's your uh, how, how did your family? I mean, obviously, you say your brother was uh, doing it with you. Did your family like support the music? Were they real? Uh, Behind it, were they kind of like, yeah, this is kind of, I don't know what's going on here. How did your family feel about uh, the music industry and all that? Well, we didn't think about the music industry. All we thought was getting our asses on stage and singing in front of all them women. That's all we cared about. You know, we were going to do this. This was going to be our thing. This was going to be our thing. This was going to be our, um, our career. And like I say to you, it wasn't until a little bit later on when we started to realize that we were coming together as a unit and we could actually do it, that we started to think more seriously about it. My mother, unfortunately, my mother and father split up when I was very young. So, um, yes, they were both very supportive, especially my mother. She used to make all of our stage stuff, you know, every, everything that we were wearing, even when we got to the, when we were on top of the pops every week, you know, and we were doing all the TV shows in England all the time. She made all our stage gear all the time. So she was very supportive. And then I had Eddie, before he joined our band, um, to look up to and to guide me. He, he taught me how to write songs so that me and him started writing songs together prolifically and getting songs recorded. And so... I had, we had plenty of things and we had our manager, Tony Hall, you know, um, I mean, he used to manage a guy called Paul Buckmaster, who used to do all, all, all Miles Davis, a string arrangement. Oh, nice. So that's, you know, when we went to America, to the Roxy, we were work with Miles Davis as musicians. Oh, nice. Nice. I remember when Miles Jenny Davis. Brown, John Lee. 90, I think it was 90, 91, he died. Because I remember on Saturday Night Live, it was somebody did a tribute. And I just looked to late great Miles Davis. And Miles Davis is a great musician. I love that whole jazz line. The whole uh, line from uh, just jazz going up through, you know, soul. And it, oh, I just love that music, man. It's great. That's my music, too. My that's, that's, your, that's, your, that's, your, that's your repertoire, obviously. That's just such a great influence. And we're here in Cleveland. We get the Rock and Hall of Fame. And uh, it's just, uh, I mean, it's just great music. Mo Motown, I can pop on Motown even in, in any of that stuff. But right now, I just listen to songs. I can listen to Temptations, you know. Uh, yeah. The, the, I can't even remember the fucking song right now, but uh, it's great music, man. I love it, love it, love it. So yeah. when you were, so in the, so when you were coming up, what, how old were you guys when you started doing like the the paid gigs or what whatnot? Were you, were you old enough to be in the club or were you kind of like a teenager still yeah. rocking? Um, we were old enough to be in the clubs then. Um, we, we, we were getting to be 17, 18. And that's when we started moving outside the ghetto. Because when we started moving outside the ghetto was when we started working outside the ghetto. So we suddenly realised there's a world out there beside this cocooned, lovely world that we were growing up in. You know, we had everything that we needed there. Restaurants, our own restaurants, where we used to go and we'd see people from all the families that we knew, you know, all the young ones who were a bit older than us. And then they knew the people who were a bit older than them, you know. Um, so we had everything there. We had everything. We had all the clubs that we could hone our craft on. They used to put us on, oh, let's put Chris and Dave in them. Put them on, you know, let them have a, you know. Let, let them, and, and we bring our band in and we, we go and play there. Then we met two guys who had the sort of the club scene wrapped up in Liverpool, the agents, and they signed us up. So we started working outside in all these sort of uh, the, the youth clubs and the, the, the sort of the clubs outside, all in the city centre and around Liverpool and things. Um, so I would say that we were probably about 18, 17, 18, 
Okay. When that okay. kind of things. That when we start to get paid. Okay. Now, how old, how old do you got to be to drink in England? Is it still? I mean, like here in the states, back then I think it was eight. Back in the seventies, it was probably like eighteen, nineteen. But I was twenty one. Is it? Is it? Uh, twenty. How old is it there? Oh, ah. Sixteen. Sixteen. It was 16. Wow, man. If I was 16, I'd go to the bar. I would probably be dead. <laughs> you couldn't get you couldn't get in a club unless you were 18. Okay. You couldn't okay. get into a club unless you were 18. Okay. It might have been 18, you know. I lied that much that I'm probably convincing myself it was 16. <laughs> but it was probably 18, and I was probably telling lies at the time, thinking it, you know, so I can't tell you. 18, something like that. We got some people in chat. If you're out there, you remember what the exact age was. Let drop us know because it does it does tend to bl blur the lines a little bit. Because I know, like in the service, you know, there would be some place you were talking about the bases over there in England. Yeah, you go. It's weird because like you could be you could be 19 over here in the states and you can't drink, but you get yeah. a nice uh, nice trip to you know RAF Mildenhall or RAF Elkenbury yeah. or well, any yeah. of the bases over there or any of the bases in Germany and all those, those guys are just going crazy. They're drinking yeah. right away. It's it's just a totally different uh, vibe. I used to go to all them bases, you know. Oh no! Which one? Which one? Mildenhall, Mildenhall, and all them. Because I used to go with Eddie, my brother, who was with Chance, um, and I was only young, so I was really thrilled. And they used to take me with them and um, see them playing on the bases. But when we actually started doing them, we played the hip part of the bases. They played the officers' club, which was a lot more cabaret. Oh they yeah. But when we started, you know, we were only dead sort of young and thing. We'd play where all the guys went and all the, yeah? The, where the, the real stuff. stuff, the real oh, stuff was going down. So um, that was like our experience of, of, of playing in them. And, and the bass, the basses are just, were just stopping when we were coming up. But I know that my brother, Eddie, used to, they used to keep them. There was loads. They used to do them all. And There's... in Germany too. And in There's so many bases after the war, after World War II, and then yeah, they started slowly closing them down. I think I know Milton Hall's still out there, and I think Elkenbury's still out there, and there might be one more, at least uh, Air Force base. I might think maybe come up on Army bases, but yeah, we uh, I, I ship some a lot of cargo to Milton Hall. MHZ was the the airport code there, so I I, I, would, when I was going to be there in '97, but they canceled it and they sent me to. Yeah, where did we go? Virginia, maybe. I don't know. I was, I, I didn't, I wasn't active. Dude. We just did a bunch of trips and stuff. But yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, I hear every. That's anything when people come into service. The first thing uh, they love, you know, if, if person experiences like Germany or England overseas, they just fall in love with the place. I mean, it's just such yeah. a. I mean, a lot of it. A lot of it's with the uh, yeah, the government money coming in. You know, they they if any any place you live and you got a nice stipend, you're gonna have a good time. But I mean, it's just different when you're over here in America and everybody's so stifled. You know what yeah. I mean? Like. And over there, it's just really laid back because it's a different kind of community, almost. You would think, you know. I mean, yeah. it's it's weird, weird to think, but it, yeah, it's great when people yeah. come up and uh, they just experience the world and just go to the UK and uh, have fun with it and just get to yeah. know and uh, bring it, bring it, bring the American influences over there. I would say the, yeah, yeah. the, the military bases in Europe had, and you touched on it quite a bit. It probably had a lot more influence on the music scene than people realize. Because I mean, was, exactly, they used to bring us our hats. Because we used to know the guys, and a lot of the guys, especially from Alkenberry and all them, who used to come, they all used to come to Toxin, a lot of them. Um, and a lot of them were married to girls from Toxin as well. Amazing. But we got to know them very, very well, I mean, within every weekend. And they used to bring us in things like apple hats. Keds, they used to be called then, the, you know, the basketball, the thingy boots. Okay. And baseball boots and things, and there was these were things that you couldn't get over here. But the guys used to bring them into us, man. Yeah, you know, lads. Yeah, you know, guys. You know, because they they were there in big bucks compared to anybody over here when you were in the forces over there. So, and we used to get all our hair stuff. You know. Oh, the product. Was, okay, okay. There wasn't any. There was hardly any black hairdressers and things where we were. You know, so they used to bring us in all our hair stuff and that that all the kale stuff and everything so yeah you know they were a big influence they were a very big influence the um the americans are, are, are on especially the black areas in all these cities like manchester at the q club in london you know um was a big place where a lot of the um the jazz used to go in there you know and um 
all the American acts, the American soul acts used to come in and used to wear the Q Club in, in, in London. That was the big place in London where all the GIs used to go and it was great. Man. It, was, it was a really good scene, you know. It was a good scene, 70s. Oh, it was. It was. I, I, I was. I was born in the seventies. Seventy. It was funny you mentioned seventy six. That was the year I was born. So, like, I that was what I saw that in the in the, your bio. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, I was uh, sitting around in my mom's belly, and he was uh, copping out this music. It's great. Listening to you to me on everything she was. That's why you're such a happy person. She was listening to us while you were in the belly. You said, <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, I came in. So, how when you first uh, started doing music and you guys mm -hmm. first cut a record, did you? get to go to the store and was it a real big thrill to see your record in the store did you experience that did you buy a bunch of records how's that work um well i couldn't afford to buy a bunch of records so we'll so that's out um it was a fantastic feeling to have a record and it was a, a damn good record as well a very very good record um produced by an american guy as a matter of fact i can't remember his name now but he was an american guy i remember um who are managing you and it was it was a song called vicious circle and it was a great song and still sounds great now um and it was a wonderful feeling uh, we weren't thinking in terms of is this going to be a hit or anything like that it was just great to have a record now our manager was obviously thinking i you know i'm going to try and make this into a hit with the guys obviously but we weren't, we were too young, man. We, we were just, you know, we had a record out. We were stars. We were stars. We had a record out, man, with real thing on the label, you know. And we knew um, by that time we were working all around the country nationally um, because we won a singing competition on national television. And that automatically made us very well known in England, very well known. It was a big TV show. And um, that's how we got our first proper record out. And um, that was like really the start of the real thing being known nationally. Even though we didn't have a hit, we were known nationally. Nice, nice. Now, did you at any point start getting recognized? Did that become like, oh, there's you know, Mr. Chris mm -hmm. out there. What's going then, on? It's awesome. That was TV show. After, After that, the TV show popped up. Okay. For a couple of weeks, people recognized us. And it was great for a couple of weeks. And then the, the show starts to wane off, you know. Right. And you're on to, you, then you're on to another single, because the single was out. It didn't happen. Got a lot of airplay, but it didn't happen. Then we put out another single called Plastic Man, and it actually got into the lower part of the chart. And we did the big show over there, which was a show called Top of the Pops, you know. And um, it started to get quite serious then. It's, you know, that was about 72. And it started to get quite serious. And we knew we were going to make it then. We knew we were going to make it then. Uh, it was still a dream. But the arrogance of youth, or not arrogance, because we were never arrogant, because um, our manager would never allow us to be. But the confidence of youth oh yeah well, you're young, and you're the just... naivety and the naivety of youth oh yeah we thought we're definitely going to make it we're definitely going to make it because let's be honest we were certainly on the way oh yeah oh yeah, yeah. i mean when you're, when you're when you're that young and you're coming up it's almost impossible to not think yeah. you're just gonna blow up I mean, especially yeah. if you're i mean i god knows when i was 17 18 19 if i would have had anything like that, it would have went right to my head. I mean, <laughs> it's probably a good thing in life I didn't get, <clears throat> you know, any kind of uh, you know fame like that because who knows what? I mean, it's 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 hard to not to. I mean, when you're young and you don't really have you know millions of dollars in the bank and people are like, oh yeah, you're cool, you're this now, you're gonna. Get... My head would be like, I got a big head as it is. It would just yeah. get any bigger. <laughs> well, let's put it this way: when you've got a song like the second one, um, Plastic Man, which almost got into the charts. And you're thinking, because you've done Top of the Pops, I mean, that's huge, Top of the Pops over here, then it was huge. And you really are known then by everyone. You think, oh, God, we've made it. But then you go into your manager's office and he's down and 
Well, I'm sorry, guys, but it's flopped again. You know, you realise, well, I thought we, I thought it was a success. And he's saying, well, no, actually, it wasn't a success. It was nearly a success, but it wasn't. It keeps your feet on the ground, you know. You, you don't, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then okay. it, took another, it took another three, four years after that of constantly putting out records that didn't happen before we got our big one. So it wasn't an overnight thing, but it was time for us. If we'd have made it, if, if, if Plastic Man, our second single, would have gone into the higher, into the charts, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now because we were nowhere near ready. We were nowhere near ready to have hit records. Yeah, we would have had our moment of fame and then it would have been nothing because we weren't ready. By 1976, we'd been to America. We'd worked with Miles Davis as musicians. We were known the country over because I was doing a lot of TV ads like Cadbury's Dairy Milk and all of them. Mine was the lead voice on them. We were ready when we got that hit, the big one, in 1976. We were ready to take it. Okay. Yeah, we could work with anyone. We could work with anyone. We could go on Pop Awards with Paul McCartney, Wings, and all of them. We could go on with them and we could hold our own, man, because we were ready. Yeah. All right, we got a question from Captain. He says, is it disappointing, Chris, to see how easy it is nowadays for less talented acts to be considered a success and how less important it is really talent actually is? I don't think talent is as much that important today, to be honest with you, depending on what you're in. You know yourself, right? If you're into serious music, talent will always mean something. And back in the day, you couldn't get a record contract without people coming to see you and making up their minds, are these guys good enough? Right. I'll tell you a little story about You To Me Are Everything. After four or five years of putting out records and me working all of us working on, I was doing the lead vocals on some of the major adverts on television at the time. Cadbury's Dairy Milk, Wrigley Sperm and Gum, um, Midland Bank, all them I was doing the lead voice on. Our manager got two very prolific songwriters to come and see the group with a view to writing us a commercial song that hopefully was going to give us our fair set record. So they came to see us in a, a club in London called Gulliver's. And the next day, they phoned our manager up and says, I'm sorry, we're not interested. We don't think that they've got a lead singer. Now, I thought to myself, well, hang on. I'm doing all these adverts that they're listening to every day on television. Jeff Wayne, who was the one who produced all these adverts, is one of the most known people in the music world. He was American, by the way. He's the producer of War of the Worlds, right? How can they say that they haven't got a lead singer anyway? We were devastated, obviously, you know, and I was, I was sick when they're saying, because I was lead singer by that point, and they were saying I was crap, basically. So, a couple of, about a week later, I was in London, I was in our manager's office, and this young Jewish guy walks in with these songs. And one of the songs was You To Me All Everything. I listened to it, I thought, God, that's Johnny Bristol. Like, that sounds like Johnny Bristol, Barry White, or all that type of stuff. We had it signed, sealed, delivered before he went out the office. So about a month later, it was released. And on that day, we were working with a guy called David Essex, who was huge in England, at Earl's Court in London. 25,000 people. And there was a radio program on that day called Roscoe's Round Table. And they used to have a guest on to review records. They played as to whether they thought they were any good or if they were going to be a hit or whatever. The guy who was on was a guy from 10CC called Graham Goldman, right? 
So he was on doing it. And 10cc were huge at the time. I remember 10cc. Yeah, they just said, I'm not in love and all that. So he listened to you to me. And he says, oh, I don't think this is going to be a hit. He said, sing as sounds if you've got a frog in his foot. Two weeks later, it was number one. Nice, nice. He so, was touching on some of them. You got to come to America. Now, when, what year would you, well, let me ask you this first before you even tour. Did you, when was your first time coming to America? And when you did tour America, like what cities did you, besides LA, obviously, you already touched on that. What uh, towns did you visit? Where, where, how, who did you tour with and stuff like that? We did three gigs there because we went with David Essex. <laughs> we hadn't had a hit record ourselves then, but he was huge in, in, in England and we were doing his backing vocals. But in England, we were doing our own show before he went on. So we were getting huge exposure, right? We sang on some of his hit records in the studio. And we also um, did Tobler Pops with him. And basically, he took us to America with him when he went to America. And the first gig, when we got there, he dropped a bombshell on us. He said, I'd like you guys to do your own show before I come on. And we said, well, how can we do that? We haven't brought our band with us. You didn't tell us. So Tony said, don't worry, guys. I'll get you a band. Because Tony knew everyone. He knew everyone over there because he'd worked with Blue Note. Right? So he got Miles Davis's uh, um, drummer, who was a guy called Jerry Brown. He got the guitar player, the bass player, who used to work with Laddie Coriel and the 11th house. And he got a, a guitar player called Reggie Lucas, who, who were also worked with Larry Coriel, and M. Toomey, who worked with Miles Davis. So these guys were backing us. And the first gig was at the bottom line in New York. Right? Yeah. And it was an invited audience. So Rod Stewart and everyone was in the, you know, in, in sitting front of all them. And all the uh, uh, David Essex's um, record company, Rolling Stone and all them magazines were all there. We got an unbelievable write-up. In fact, we went down probably <laughs> as well as David, right? But it wasn't us who was going down, man. It was the musicians who were behind us. <laughs> they were the ones who got the standing ovation. But nevertheless, they taught us a lot, you know. And I'll, tell, I'll go on to that but later on. Then we worked the Roxy in L.A., and then we were a, a big place in St. Louis. So they were the th three places that we were. And that was the very first time I'd ever been on a plane. Oh, wow. Wow. First time on a plane. It was the first time um, we'd ever been to America. And our manager, I sat with him on the plane, Tony Hall. He said, this is going to change your life forever. So relish it. He said, once you land, in New York, it's going to change your life forever. And the guys, when we went on that first night, they called me up, you know, we're talking and dressing room and says, hey guys, we don't mean to be funny, man. We love your material, but you're old fashioned, man. But we said, well, how do you mean? He said, well, <coughs> as well, they don't wear that type of stuff over here anymore, man. And they don't do those stupid dances that you do. So we thought about it and we thought, okay. So the next night, we completely threw all the stage gear stuff away and just went on in our normal street clothes. We stopped doing routines and we never, ever, from that day on, did routines, dance routines, or wore stage gear that was all the same again ever and we were the very first black band in england to do that the okay oh so you guys are like you took the american influence and put it in there in your thing okay that was as a result of going to america and it's like deja vu because a couple about 20 years later we wrote a track called children of the ghetto which was recorded by philip bailey from earth Wind and fire produced by Phil Collins. And he was doing a tour over here with Stanley Clark, George Duke. And we got a call. They were doing the Manchester Apollo. And we got a call to say that Philip Bailey had invited us down, you know, to the 
theatre and to hear him singing one of a song that we wrote children of the ghetto backed musically by george duke and stanley clark was one of the highlights of my and my brother's career to see awesome, them man. guys playing a song that you'd written the best falsetto singer that there's ever been in philip bailey from earth wind and fire to two of the best musicians that there's ever been in george duke and stanley clark was just unbelievable and it's the same drummer the same drummer who backed us when we went to america all those years before nice on the bottom line and the roxy in la that's nice. a small world man now did you, that's a small when, world. When, you, when you when you have people telling you that your life's gonna change when you go to new york now you land in new york is there and new york's a big fun town i've been to new york several times it's got some of the biggest buildings in the world it's 24 hours a day walking around you can never get away from people what was was it like uh was there any kind of culture shock coming to see that many people i mean london's pretty big england's pretty big you guys got a lot of crowded uh cities there too but like what was the biggest things that struck you of america you know that you're like wow this is crazy or i never knew about this or something like that the music man i dead music that i'd never heard before never heard it in england before you know um guys were walking around they were going to work they were rapping this is before rap, but real rap. And like they were with headphones on, man. They were singing. They were these bands busking. And they were unbelievable. We went to the Fender factory where I bought a guitar. You know, it, it was just electrifying. That's all I can say. Below the buildings, I mean, you can get big buildings anywhere. Oh, yeah, 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 for it sure. Was just, it was electrifying. It was electrifying. That's all I can say to you. The whole city was like walking onto a movie studio. It really is when you go to New York, man. Because it's like, because there's so many films that were filmed there, obviously. You walk around like, oh, yeah, yeah there's a building from Broadway. Oh, yeah. Broadway. You walk, you know, you see all them. You're like walking into a film. You're like walking into a film. You know, it was, um, the people were amazing. It's just, they were just, everything was just amazing. Especially oh. when we talk. Talk, man. Talk again. Hey, love. Again, people in America, we love, we love accents. We love Hey, guys, guys, oh. these guys are from Liverpool. These guys are from Liverpool. The Beatles, man. You know, and all that. It was just, it was, uh, it was great. Oh yeah, anybody in America, we just love accents over here. We're uh, we're obsessed with. Them. I mean, cool. It's funny because like you know, somebody from there, I talked to a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of you guys over in England, and there's so many different accents. I can't even comprehend it because they're like, well, yeah, if you drive down the road 30 minutes, there's another accent, and over here, you just you know, everybody talks the same kind. We got accents here or there, but when we get accents over here, everybody thinks it's English. We don't, don't can't differentiate. Like, oh, that's Northern England. That's you know, a Scouse accent. That's a uh, you know, Cockney accent. Yep. We, it takes a lot of education for us to even yeah. so any exit we just think is cool as hell right when you guys come over it's great <laughs> yeah right, so what point did you uh we got it I mean, and we talked about this in the pre-show a little bit but you're a really big dog guy you're obviously a dog breeder and i mentioned to you yeah. two you know 10 people seven of them said dogs so what yeah. was when you were growing up what was your first dog that you had that you remember um it was a cross alzation a cross German Shepherd. Um, I, I became interested in dogs when we were rec I saw this album sleeve by a great artist, Johnny Guitar Watson. Do you remember him? I do not. Never really. Black got soul, jazz soul, funk okay. guy. And on the sleeve, he was, he was sat there with an Afghan hound. Right? And I always said to myself, I'm going to have it was in a soft back car as well and they had an afghan hound in it and i said to myself when i make it i'm gonna have an afghan hound in one of those cars right so i always remember we'd had a few hits and we were recording one of our biggest ones which was a song called can you feel the force 
and I was staying with our producer, Ken Gold. And when I went to his house, he had two Afghan hands. And I decided that night, right, that's it. I've always wanted one, I'm gonna get one. So next day we went and bought an, Af an Afghan hound. And I've had Afghan hounds ever since. Um, and now I've got Irish wolfhounds as well, the big ones, yeah. And the big show around the world is a show called Crooks. That's the big one. And I actually won best in show at that. So that's another number one. Nice, nice. Now, how many uh, you, you were in the, the? I read that you and your wife are into breeding dogs. Is, is you got like a dog kennel, or how does that work? Yeah, we got kennels. We got kennels because I keep, you know, at least six to eight dogs, and so I have kennels built outside where they stay, and I show them. Obviously, it's a hobby that I do, so I exhibit. You know, like your Westminster. Yeah, yeah. Every year, well, that's the same for us over here, and. Um, something that i really enjoy doing and um it's very serious it's not you know it's fun but it's serious oh those dog shows i have not, i mean you you see uh uh you know rules and and stuff and i watch those dog shows and they take it like i guess some, they take the dog and compare it to the breed standard and judge That's the teeth and the, and the fur and the gait and the oh my goodness it's it's intense yeah. and those guys are really into it like the yeah, guy yeah. will come out with the tux and this guy over here, I'm over here. And it's uh, it's crazy, man. It's a really cool world. I'm really yeah, fascinated with the uh, dog it group, it the whole scene, man. It's a crazy world. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. It's fun. You've got to take it seriously, it, depending on what you want. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of people just do it. Over here, it's a lot less intense. But you, a lot of people do it, you know, just for a nice day out with the dog. You want to show the dog and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but if you aspire to be very successful and win something like Westminster or the Crufts, well, then you're shown at the very highest level. So your dogs have got to be very, very good. Oh, yeah. And yes, they are judged to a breed standard. Um, but don't think in any way that the dogs are molly cuddled and things like that, because that is the worst thing that you can possibly do for a show dog. My dogs, if you saw them now, they're just out in the mud, running on the field, out in the mud. Uh, and that's their life, you know, until we go to a dog show when they're cleaned up, brushed out properly, groomed out properly, taught how to behave with other dogs and to be touched by a person. Then once that's over, once you've been 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the ring, you come out, you're just a normal dog again, and you are off on your way. Oh, yeah. The do dogs get up there for their little uh, glam shot, and then they come out and just, they want to be dogs, man. They want to go sniff other dogs' butts and eat dog food. And, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. They don't want to. People always think, you know, like these prissy dogs are sitting on a giant pillow and bring yeah. in the fancy water and the fancy filet mignon. Yeah. Yeah, these dogs are out there just snicking butts and doing everything else, man. Heck yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing could be further than the truth. I mean, I'm not saying that aren't people who, who, who really are fanatical about things like that, but I can assure you. 90% of people who show dogs don't fall into that trap. Because once you fall into that trap, if a, your dog is used to lying on pillows in front of a fire all day, what's it going to be like when you're dragging it in the middle of a cold field, <laughs> pissing down with rain, right? And you've got to go through your paces. It's going to say, hey, <laughs> blow you. I want to get back into the warmth, you know? Um, no, you can't, you know. Everything's, um, everything's fun. Everything's fun, but it's like everything else. I have fun. The group have fun when we're backstage. But when we get on stage, it's serious fun. It's serious fun. You don't go on and make an idiot to yourself. You go on and you make sure everything's right. Oh, yeah, you're paid there. To, audience, they, they pay, audience. If, people, if people pay to see you or pay to see that dog, you got to bring the heat. You can't insult them by... You know, exactly. coming up and doing whatever. Exactly. It's a certain level of uh, decorum you need to have on that, for sure. Exactly. exactly. Now, do you, you have, you have these Afghan hounds. I, I know them Afghan hounds. They got that long for a real long. Yeah. But now, do you brush that yourself? Do you outsource that? How long does it take to groom an Afghan dog? Now, we do it ourselves, and it takes about four hours for a show. <sighs> for a show. The night before oh, a show, sure. four hours. Yeah. Well, the typical, typical grooming, like say it's a, you know, next week, and you, you you know, snows or the hound needs to get taken out for a clip. How long does that, like an hour? I mean, how long just to get the net mats out the fur and all that? 
But you've got to make sure they don't get mats in the fair, number one. Oh, so stop it because before it goes? Okay, okay. So what you do is you keep on top of it. So with an afghan, you have to give it a, a little bit of a groom each day. If it comes in out the wet, make sure it's dry, goes into somewhere nice and warm in the kennel. And when it's dry, you just make sure that it's got no big leaves and things like that. And you just got to use your common sense. Yeah, yeah, just like a pool you where you like a little, yeah. little bit you've each got day. You, if you've got no air, you, you have nothing to do. An Irish, an Irish wolfhound, you groom, give it a brush <laughs> once a week, and it's done. With an Afghan hound, you know, if it's like now, but raining and really muddy, well, then, you, you know, once dry, you make sure that its coat's not matted together so that when you come to bathing it, it's easy. You know, otherwise, you lose all your coat. Now, have you? This is a totally random question. I just randomly thought this. Have you ever used any of your dogs as like a background, like the Christmas dogs jingle, roof, roof, roof? Ever done anything like that, or think of anything like that? Like here's Christmas dogs singing uh, jingle bells or something. Like, something funny? No, no. But I've done when he won crooks, He was like sort of he he'd, he'd be using adverts for dog food, like Pedigree Chum was a big dog food thing then. So when he won that, that's all part of the the deal where. You say my dog eats pedigree chum, that type of thing. But um, no, I'm not into all that. I'm not into all that. You know, I just love the competition of showing a dog, and I love the work that goes with seeing the dogs in lovely muscular condition and nice condition. But I'm not really into the into that side of it. You know, I'm not. Yeah. No doubt, no doubt. Now we got a question from Captain here. This is going to lead to now. What is after post? You know, the seventies and all that. What did you guys? You know, did you keep touring? Did you kind of just casually do music? And what kind of influence? What kind of music do you like today? Like you had, you said you had a song, "Children of the Ghetto." That's a, I, I'm going to have to listen to it after this. Now there's there was a song by Dr. Dre called "Little Ghetto Boy," which I think is, is similar sounding uh, title, and that, that was uh, probably I would imagine a similar concept. What kind of uh, music do you pop in today? Or I mean, do you still like going out and performing? Or what's up with that? We're performing all the time. We're writing all the time. Okay. Um, I like more of like the jazz funk type stuff. I like hip hop. I like jazz. I like R and B. If you were gonna nail me down i would have to say i like more i'm more into the jazz funky type of stuff like you marcus miller things like that stanley clark that's what i really listen to and with r and I mean i used to obviously i love anyone who's singing great songs great ballads great songs luther vandross people like that i used to love um and basically i like Anything that's got really great vocals and great musicianship. That's the type of music I'm really into. But if you have to pin me down, I like more to the sort of the smoother, jazzy, funky type stuff. That's what I lean towards, in all honesty. Okay, so like if you were to perform, like say, hey, Chris, I want you to perform. Would you prefer like a small, tight little jazz club? Or would you rather do like an arena or a you know, Wembley Stadium? What would it be like what you would prefer? You're not not necessarily your dream gig, but what would you prefer to do on a on a like if I just hired you for a concert or something? You said, okay, I'm, let's pick a choice. I, you can pick a you know small club, big venue, or Wembley Stadium. What are you gonna pick out of that? What do you prefer? In between, I don't like doing the Wembley stadiums because normally when we do them, it's only a cameo. Right, right, a couple minutes. So you're just doing your hits. Um, I don't like clubs so much because you can't do what I would term a proper show once again you're doing a certain type of show for people who come to see our type of music they want to dance and things when you're in a club so i like to do theaters with about three four thousand people because right. then we can do a really a really a comprehensive show with our hit records but also leaves room for us to do new product as well and more serious songs so people can have a really good mixture and get to know the depth of what the real thing are about. And um, there are a lot of people out there who, like you to me, are everything. But there's also a lot of people out there who appreciate a song like Children of the Ghetto. And 
once they've finished singing along to you to me they like to sit back and say well give us something that we can just you know and then they'll get something like children of the ghetto things like that that will make them think a bit nice nice so are you do you guys, you guys are you done touring america are you gonna i mean it's uh you know we're not 20 anymore are we what's are you just gonna kind of do you what, what like what do you do on a typical day-to-day -day basis are you like uh you know just writing songs petting the dogs and you know doing a gig when when you feel like it or what's uh what's we, the typical work, we like? work all we work all over europe we work all over europe um most years um and when i'm not working I'm creating and when I'm not creating I'll have a couple of days a month where I'll take my dogs to a show and just chill out and relax but uh, most of the time like I say we are a working we do work a lot we do festivals throughout the summer a lot of big festivals we do our own theatre where it's an evening with real thing where you know once again you get a really nice comprehensive show we'll do clubs We'll do clubs as well, um, where, you know, we, we, we'll do a nice, let's have a good time show. Um, and yeah, that's what we do, you know. Um, and that's what we've always done. Uh, it, even the all the years when we haven't been having, having hits. If you know you're good, and if you believe in yourself, I'm a firm believer that things come around. Now, two years ago, we had a movie. Um, out about the real thing called Everything and that was covered by the BBC it went into a lot of the cinemas in England but it was cut short by Covid so what we're hoping to do as things start to get back to normal is to reissue that in all the cinemas and Dave and I will do a question and answer once the film's been seen it's about 90 minutes long okay. and it's basically it's all it charts the whole political era of our growing up and everything, it goes right back to early real thing. It's got all the archives and it's very, very interesting, you know, and uh, so we'll be doing that as well. Good stuff, man. So how can people get a hold of you and what is your latest, like do you guys, are you guys still cutting out new music or what, uh, what's, I mean, are you just kind of seeing classics in combination or what's, uh, yeah. Yeah. what's the vibe going? Our latest um, album is a, an album called Brand New Day. It was released two days ago. Okay. And it features, um, it's all new stuff apart from Children of the Ghetto, which we've redone um, live. Nice. And that was out two days ago. So we're going to be promoting that. There's also our film, Everything, which you can get on Blu-ray and DVD from Amazon. So we'll be promoting that as well. So, um, yeah, that's space. Oh, we've also got a box set that uh, uh, you can get on Amazon. Um, it's a, it's a six, seven CD box set released by Cherry Red Records, which features everything that we've ever recorded on it. And I think it's one of the first times that this has been done, um, which you can get on Cherry Red Records on Amazon. So we'll be promoting that as well. So, yeah, we'll be doing new music, a lot of gigs throughout the summer and everything. We don't stop. We work all the time. Oh, and man. people can come and see us in all over Europe. We're doing Germany. We're doing Bucharest. We're doing Holland. So all around Europe. Nice. Outstanding. Well, I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Emu for coming out today. I appreciate it, my friend. It was an honor. Uh, be sure to definitely. I'm going to check out that uh, Children of the Ghetto song. That sounds really cool. I'm Please gonna, check it out, man, because you'll like definitely it. Definitely going to listen to that after this. Man. You can actually have a, a good listen to it. If you go onto iTunes or Amazon, well, Amazon, you only get 30 seconds, unless you're going to buy it. But if you want to have a listen to it, go onto iTunes or go on to our Facebook page and you've got the two singles. You've got a full version of Children of the Ghetto on there, which you can watch and you'll hear the song. I'd like you to hear it because I think you in particular, I think you would probably appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm I'm really gonna because because I, I really like uh I like the doctor the doctor Ray uh, uh oh, that's, that's, better. That's, better. A, that, that's a great that's a great song and I'm I'm thinking this song's greatly probably along that same line that's good stuff man I like to appreciate you taking it out man join us next week we got uh, Felix Wright coming out uh it was an honor sir I appreciate it. much love you take care man see ya all right take it easy brother bye.